Welcome to About Writing. I'm your host, Ben Cheever, and today we have a guest whom I've never met before. Her name is Susan Cheever, and she's come here with a book um, called Desire, where sex meets addiction. That's it. That's right. I got it right. And um, tell us about this book, Susan. Are you any relation to that <laughs> famous writer? What was his name? James ben James Cheever. Cheever. Ben Cheever. <laughs> I think that was a famous writer who I had to read a, a story of his. Hmm. It was called the it was called the bathing pool. I had to read it in high school. It was a very that long, was, sad that was story. Ben Cheever. Ben it was Cheever. A novel it? called The Plagiarist. <laughs> oh, it was. Excellent novel. Yes, I, I'm related to Ben Cheever. I'm his sister. You're his sister. Yes. Oh. Yes. Well, he must be very difficult to live with. <laughs> oh no, he's just a piece of cake. And very handsome he's too. He's a sweetheart. <laughs> incredibly handsome. Looks a little bit like Charlie Rose. <laughs> Only nicer, better, younger. Uh -huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, and, uh, shorter. <laughs> no, it's my pleasure to be his sister. Well, um, it's, it's a great pleasure for us to have you here in Pleasantville related to that famous writer, it's uh, a pleasure Charlie Cheever. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us, about, uh, tell us about this book. Did your writing this book have anything to do with your having written a book about Bill W? Well, it's a book, mm -hmm. Desire, it's a book about addiction. And in fact, um, first tell us who Bill W is. In oh, case Bill W. Bill Wilson yeah. is the man who co-founded Alcoholics mm -hmm. Anonymous. And one of the interesting things about Bill Wilson, mm. of about whom I wrote a biography, is that he was an addict himself. He had a terrible drinking problem. Mm -hmm. He lost everything, almost died, and he figured out for himself, mm -hmm. little by little, a way to stay sober. And when he realized that that worked. Then he figured it out for one other person, mm -hmm. and then they figured it out for 10 other people, and thus Alcoholics Anonymous was begun. Which is still the most successful way to it's treat addiction. It's certainly the most successful way to treat addiction, although there are no statistics on addiction treatment, so oh. it's really very hard to oh, know. I didn't know that. Uh, but it's, it's certainly, by anecdotal uh, evidence, uh. the most successful way, and it has, you know, two or three million members all over the world. So the 12-step mm -hmm. program has been very successful, but Bill Wilson himself was an addict and he gave up drinking, but he died of emphysema because he could not stop smoking. Mm -hmm. And another thing about him was that he had a 38-year marriage, but he very often stepped off the reservation, as mm. his friends say. What does that mean, stepping off? Cheated on his wife, <laughs> okay. stepped off the reservation. And it's it, one of the questions that I was asked a great deal when mm. I was touring for Bill Wilson was, was Bill Wilson a sex addict? Mm -hmm. so people seemed very interested mm. in that. and so They knew about it. They knew, well, they knew that he had stepped off the reservation, they knew that he had smoked, uh -huh. and they wondered if he was a sex addict. And another thing that happened was, I got this phone call from a Canadian editor, Rob Sanders, mm -hmm. who had this very mellifluous, sexy voice, mm -hmm. and I was avoiding work. And uh, sometimes you call me, right? <laughs> but it w you didn't call that day. Uh -huh. Instead, this guy called, uh -huh. and he was doing an anthology about addiction. Mm -hmm. And he wanted me to write a piece, but we didn't know which addiction I should write about. Mm -hmm. So because he had this wonderful voice, mm -hmm. we got to talking, and we started talking about sex and falling uh -huh. in love and the difficulties of mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. And I realized as I was talking to him, that the very things I was describing, the obsession, mm -hmm. the promising you're not going to and doing it mm -hmm. anyway, the remorse, uh, other people's reactions, that th I was describing falling in love, but I realized that that was exactly the way I felt about alcohol, mm -hmm. that what I was describing was the addictive arc. And I had mm -hmm. never realized before that that it also applied to falling in love. But then I started reading, mm -hmm. and it turns out that falling in love is an addictive experience. The brain chemistry is the same, the behavior is the same, the similar, symptoms are similar. the same. Similar, similar. I think the, I think the same, I'm going to disagree right. with you. I know, I know you don't like that. <laughs> But I think the same has to do with the crudeness of our measuring devices at this point. I think similar is probably more accurate. The idea that a cocaine high right. is the same as the high you feel when you've rushed into the burning building and saved the baby um, Well, that's from not death. falling in love. Right. Um, no, but, I, but what, I'm, what I'm saying is that we're beginning to take pictures of the brain, which we could never do before, right. and we're finding similarities. Right which we're drawing conclusions from. And I think the similarities are instructive, but I think it's a mistake to make too much I'm not saying it's them. the yeah, same. I'm yeah. saying it's an addictive experience. Right. There are many different kinds of addictive experiences. Okay. What I hadn't realized mm. is that falling in love is one of okay. them. And that it has 
you know, then I went mm. and talked to a lot of experts, and none of them could even agree on what addiction was, mm -hmm. to make your point. Yes, yeah. uh, but the consensus symptoms um, all applied to falling mm -hmm. in love. So that was pretty interesting mm -hmm. to me. And as somebody who's fallen in love mm -hmm. frequently with n not, not always particularly right great mm -hmm. consequences and gotten married mm -hmm. frequently, mm -hmm. perhaps sometimes mm -hmm. to the wrong person, mm -hmm. you might say, mm -hmm. um, uh, it dawned on me that that was the key to some of the things that had happened in my life. And you also thought it was fascinating that while it's hard to get someone to speak up for heroin, it's very easy to get someone to speak up for love. Right. Words, it was interesting mm -hmm. to me, although this came to me quite late, mm -hmm. that of all the addictions, if we're going to call it an addiction, mm -hmm. that we have in our mm -hmm. culture, and we have many, I mm -hmm. mean, the obesity epidemic, mm -hmm. nobody talks about mm -hmm. food addiction, you mm -hmm. know, the divorce, I mean, we don't mm -hmm. want to talk about addiction, mm -hmm. but it, it's certainly there. And addiction is a broken promise, a promise well, you break Well, that's my yourself. definition yeah. of it. Okay. Um, but because so I believe... So I'm not going to eat this cupcake. And you eat it anyway. Yeah, or I'm not going to feel up the airline hostess. But you do it anyway. Yeah. Or I'm not going to sleep with my cousin, mm. but you do it mm. anyway. Mm. Um, I'm just going to go have lunch with this guy. Mm. You find yourself sleeping with mm -hmm. him. I'm only going to have two drinks. Mm -hmm. Five drinks later, mm. you think, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do any more cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not going to gamble again. Mm -hmm. but, but I'm, you know, not all addiction specialists agree that the broken promise is part of it. Mm -hmm. That's actually my definition, mm -hmm. because to my mind, addiction requires remorse. Mm -hmm. And the broken promise is what leads you to remorse. And you think remorse is part of the cycle? I do too. Mm -hmm. I do. But yeah. the DSM-4 doesn't. Uh -huh. In other words, the DSM-4 measures addiction by its negative impact on your life. Oh, okay. I measure it by remorse. Mm -hmm. Patrick Carnes, mm. in other words, some people measure it by remorse, some mm. people don't. As I say, there was almost no agreement mm. to my amazement. Mm -hmm. So I ended up sort of writing a book about addiction, mm -hmm. about sex addiction, but really about addiction, trying to get a handle on what it is, how you could recognize mm -hmm. it, how to define it, how it applies to love as well as other things, yeah. and what to do about it, although really nobody knows what to do nobody about it, it. And nobody really knows what it is. Mm -hmm. In other words, there are many, many theories about what causes it. Um, Certainly, there's a genetic component. Certainly, there's an environmental component. Mm -hmm. um, you know, certainly, there's a component of trauma. But, and one of the f things you feel strongly about is the, that there are people still, used to be everybody, I think, who think, just don't do it. Whatever it is you're doing that's destructive, whether it's finishing the box of chocolate chip cookies or sleeping with your secretary, you should just not do it. Well, right, a not, lot of people mm, still, no, mm -hmm. even after everything mm -hmm. we know, don't believe in addiction. Mm -hmm. They think it's a, a, a willpower problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea mm -hmm. of addiction, any addiction, mm -hmm. is that it exists outside of our linear cause and mm -hmm. effect thinking. It's not a willpower problem. It's but not a self-control problem. But aren't you un encouraging, see, I'm going to play, the, aren't you encouraging no, bad behavior? by insisting that this is beyond our... Well, no, yeah. because yeah. the people who say, oh, if we say it's a disease that's encouraging bad behavior, mm -hmm. addicts are completely responsible for what they do. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they're not responsible. Mm -hmm. You know, powerless mm -hmm. and, and responsible can go together. Mm -hmm. You know, it may be that I can't help doing mm -hmm. something that hurts you. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean I'm not responsible. Mm -hmm. They don't go together at all. That's mm -hmm. just a that's just a fake way that argument that people use to avoid so the somebody, possibility of addiction existing. So somebody gets drunk and kills someone on the highway. They're you still totally think they responsible. Should go, yeah, go to jail. They should go to jail. Yeah. They should also mm -hmm. get treatment for their alcoholism, yeah. mm -hmm. by the way, which doesn't mm -hmm. happen. Mm -hmm. um, but they should. Mm -hmm. They're certainly responsible. I don't think anybody believes that addicts aren't responsible for the results of their behavior. But c some people would argue that if you if you say um, uh, it's an addiction, then you're giving a person an excuse to not, you know, not, to not control themselves. You're giving them, you're, you're making How? a, because here's the person, assuming that we live in, that we're rational creatures, which I'm, I'm as an assumption, <laughs> I'm, for not, I'm not going to make, because I know I'm not. Right. Ra assuming you're a rational creature and, and along comes the drink or the, uh, babe, or the and you and you get it, you grab it, then you can say, well, I, it was beyond my power. Rather than um, 
if you knew that you're going to be, if, if you felt that you had control over it, you'd stop that. Well, then. even if you say it was beyond mm -hmm. my power, you're still responsible mm -hmm. as an adult. So for how your do actions. you deal? How does a person who's who's supposing it's a young woman? And such as yourself, <laughs> and she, and she's married to somebody else, and along comes this handsome, attractive, available guy, and she thinks I'd like to sleep with him. And uh, then, uh, what does she do to keep from waking up at four o'clock in the afternoon in a hotel room with him? Well, the first, mm. the the, mm. I think the most important thing, mm -hmm. at least where we are now, mm -hmm. in two thousand and eight, um, to combat addiction is to acknowledge it. Yeah. Um, because usually she wakes up in a hotel room mm. at four in the afternoon with the guy she didn't mean to sleep mm. with and goes, oh my God, I lost my self-control. Mm -hmm. And that's really not going to help her mm -hmm. because that isn't really what happened. You know, what happened is an addictive process, mm -hmm. which is pretty well mapped. I mean, mm -hmm. people do agree that mm -hmm. How how the addictive how the addictive arc goes mm -hmm. is is pretty well agreed upon. Whether or not it includes mm -hmm. remorse, is not so mm -hmm. agreed upon. But you know, if she doesn't understand why that happened, it's going to happen again. Mm -hmm. If she understands why it happened, at least she has some knowledge of what's driving her, of what's going on, and therefore a much better chance of keeping it from happening again. And I'm not against yeah. people falling in love yeah. and sleeping with each other at all. Mm -hmm. I just think that if we understood that falling in love is an addictive experience mm -hmm. and that it has all the symptoms of an addictive experience, it has obsession, mm -hmm. it has the addictive trance, it has the world narrows down to this mm -hmm. one person, it has I'm going to spend this week working because and not see the person mm -hmm. because I need to do my work and mm -hmm. before you know it you're seeing the person. Mm -hmm. It has all those things that are characteristic yeah. of addiction and another thing that it has that is characteristic of addiction is it's time limited. Mm -hmm. So without obstacles mm -hmm. falling in love lasts about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And during those 18 months, way too many people get married and have mm. children. Mm -hmm. So all I'm saying is enjoy this, mm -hmm. recognize it for what it is, have a ball, but don't get married and have children because yeah. you're going to wake up in three years and barely recognize mm. the person mm -hmm. who is the father of your child mm -hmm. because that addictive part will be over with and you'll have to create some other kind of love, and which think people, many people can. I think people do learn that in time. I think they learn that in time. Well, our divorce rate mm. is astonishingly mm. high. So clearly they don't learn it enough. No, I, I agree. And I always, I, I think it'll be, be I, I think it's going to be better for this next generation. For one thing, they don't get married so quickly since birth control is now more the, Their divorce practiced. rate isn't any lower. In other words, they're doing the same thing. They're falling in mm. love. They're thinking this is the mm. one because that's how it feels. Mm -hmm. Um, they're getting married, they're having children, and they're waking up five years later or three years mm -hmm. later and going, Who's this person? Who's this person? They snore. Mm -hmm. They don't have any money. Mm -hmm. What am I doing? And, you know, because they're young, there's this other person who makes them feel the mm -hmm. way. How many times have you heard somebody say, He or she makes mm -hmm. me feel the way my husband or wife used, used to, to make, make me feel? feel. So mm -hmm. all I'm saying is they're saying that because they don't understand what's happened to them. Mm -hmm. and neither did I understand mm -hmm. what was happening to me. So I sort of wrote the book in the hope that some young woman might read it and go, oh, the, I've mm -hmm. fallen in love, yeah. but I shouldn't get married. Mm -hmm. I should wait it out. Right. I, should, I should hang out for three years and see who this person really is and what kind of partnership we could really have. Because at the moment, I mean, falling in love is so powerful, mm. so transformative. It's dizzying. It's an astonishing experience. I know, I know. I've heard yes, that. exactly. <laughs> but, and it blinds mm. you. You know, but so on the other you need hand, to wait it out. Well, I mean, I, 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 ag I agree, except that, um, you know, in, to some, I also, you know, kind of take the, you know, the platonic idea that we're all really half a person, and and uh, and that a lot of us just feel like half a person until a lot of men feel like half a person until they're married. I mean, right. we know that the cliche is that that's how women feel. In fact, there are plenty of men who feel that way too. Right. And and uh, so yeah, if you can form a marriage-like alliance with a three-year limit on it. 
and and uh, and not and restrain from having children that that'd be good. And then after three years or however many years you could think again. Also, I think going with your eyes open is a good idea. But there is a different, I mean, it's hard. Um, I guess it's hard with food too. It's not hard with nicotine or alcohol because they aren't really nutrients. But, right. but it's hard to draw the line between the thing that you really need that enriches your life and the thing that no, no, that, it's not hard um, at all. They're completely separate things. I don't think they're separate, completely separate. And and the other mm -hmm. thing that I think is that people think that it's cause and effect, that falling in love leads to the kind of love which allows you to partner with someone for life. Well, it can. Sometimes it does, yeah. and sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what you have to know. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go, this is it. In 10 years, we're going to be happily raising mm -hmm. two children. Maybe, maybe not, mm -hmm. as our divorce rate shows. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all I'm saying is know mm -hmm. that this is a state which is an addictive state mm -hmm. in which your brain chemistry is doing, which is very much mm -hmm. like what would happen with a less appealing substance, mm -hmm. and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's really the message of the book is, I mean, what I say about the book is it might keep you from marrying the wrong person. Also, if you're married to someone and along comes someone who excites the impulses you felt with the first person, well, then you don't go. <laughs> well, that's one yeah, of the yeah, tricks yeah. of having a lifelong partnership mm. is that you know how to deal with the other people mm. who come along who mm. make you feel the way that person mm. used to make mm -hmm. you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, but whether a person is, is the person mm. with whom you can really partner. Well, so you can fall in and out of love. You can fall in love more than once with the same person, or that's sort mm, of the mind. Maybe. I don't I, know. I mean, yes. I mean, I, that dizzying, transformative thing, I don't know. But I do know oh, yeah, that, I that that's often what happens mm -hmm. at the beginning, uh -huh. and that it it really doesn't last. I mean, maybe it can come back mm -hmm. a little, but you need in order to stay married to somebody, you need a different kind of thing. What Helen Fisher calls attachment, uh, a thing that's not addictive, a thing where you're actually building I, a life together. I hate to be a Pollyanna. Yes, you do. You do need that. Yes. But I think it is quite possible to have uh, uh, eighteen months. Uh, honeymoon type relationship with someone and then uh, um, uh, a, you know a truce <laughs> an alliance and then five years later have the honeymoon with that same person again I think that's possible in well, fact I think great that's, yeah I, think I that, mean that's yeah. you know we it's interesting because yeah. we have completely different mm -hmm. experiences mm -hmm. here you through mm -hmm. good judgment mm -hmm. or good fortune mm -hmm. or the right alignment mm -hmm. of the stars mm -hmm. fell in love with the person with whom you can partner mm -hmm. a life and mm -hmm. have magnificently well, I've, partnered I've, I've a been life. Married twice, I had one. Right, the first marriage. person yeah. was yeah. you had. Yeah. I had the experience mm -hmm. you had with your first yeah. wife three times. Mm -hmm. um, each time, I I sort of came to five years later and thought, this yeah. is not the person yeah. with whom I can partner a life for very specific mm -hmm. reasons, and and one of the reasons, of course early on was that there were other people who made me feel the way this person used mm -hmm. to make me mm -hmm. feel. But your experience mm -hmm. with Janet is that it can happen that way. You were totally in love with each other. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of transformative, wild-eyed, mm -hmm. dizzying mm -hmm. love affair. Mm -hmm. And that was 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. 27, so 27. 27 years ago. So it can happen mm -hmm. that one can but lead we've to also the gone, other. I mean, we've, we've gone... We've gone, you know, we go in, and, you know, we're right in, we're in a honeymoon period right now. Right. I mean, we're, I th we're in many ways in, in love with each other now as we were. Hasn't always been, as you know. Right. We've had, right. we've had our right. differences or our periods where we di weren't so happy with each other. But we're, right. but, but um, for me, I think, uh, um, I think I was very hurt by seeing my father, your father, cheat repeatedly and noisily on my mother. Um, and I think I were, and I think Fred had the same experience, our brother Fred. That seemed to me like such an ugly thing, you know, like a cop seeing a bad accident. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. also, um, he boasted about his heterosexual affairs because the ones that really married to him, mattered to him were his right. homosexual affairs. He made it almost seem like a chore you know, dating these women. <laughs> it was like something he did, you know, to, to get a tax deduction or something. So I think the combination of those two things made for me the idea of, um, of cheating on, on, a, on a wife 
just so odious under any circumstances. It just seemed like a really bad, nasty thing to do. Mm. You know, like mm. it, you know, the difference between in in, in any love, uh, you you have conflict, and and you hurt each other to some extent. But it seemed to me like to go out and sleep with someone else when you're married to someone is the equivalent of just you're having a wrestling match and now I'm going to use a hand grenade. I mean, it seemed like. I'm really going to hurt you, and I'm going to hurt your sense of yourself as a woman, and you know I'm, I'm going to hurt you every way I can. I'm mm. going to take it, go at the very root of who you think you are, and just rip it out. Mm. So I never wanted to do that, and I think Fred feels the same way. I guess you know they say that each child mm. has different parents. Yeah. I think what I saw, I mean, we certainly mm. grew up in a an atmosphere where we got served trauma mm -hmm. as frequently as we got served <laughs> chipped beef <laughs> and in all kinds uh, of ways uh -huh. and a very sexualized atmosphere yeah. because there was the secret, mm -hmm. our father's secret mm -hmm. homosexual life mm -hmm. going on to beat the band, mm -hmm. who knew, mm -hmm. um, as, well as, his, <laughs> as well as his very well documented and, and bragged about heterosexual uh -huh. affairs. affairs and mummy also confided in me about her heterosexual affairs. Uh -huh. So, but I think what remember when he came back from California, and we came up with the phrase "sacks of uh, stacks of satisfied starlets." <laughs> was well, so that was the kind of thing that he <laughs> that he liked us to come up with. But I think what I saw with them certainly he didn't mm -hmm. make cheating look good, mm -hmm. but they made staying married look so um. bad to me. They, it mm. seemed to me that they only stayed married mm. out of fear, mm -hmm. out of inadequacy, out of stupidity. They made each other miserable mm -hmm. every single day that I could see. They repeatedly told me how miserable they <laughs> made each other. Well, but that was that always excited sympathy, right? I believed mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I really think even now mm -hmm. that they would have been each would have been much better off if the minute they had The Last mm -hmm. of Us, I'm, they mm -hmm. split. I still mm -hmm. think. You know, I think there was tremendous anguish in that marriage for him, who was who was using it mm. to keep his homosexuality for s secret. Mm. For her, who knew he was <laughs> using her to keep his homosexuality secret. You know, I I just I looked at that marriage and I thought, you know, um, maybe I'll try this, but I am not going to be one of these people who's still crying 40 years later <laughs> and saying, we've been married for 40 years. I think they almost destroyed each other, mm -hmm. came very close. Well, he may have destroyed her. She he was- could easily, But you could make an argument that if married to other people or even not married, that they were both the kind of people who would have destroyed themselves under almost I don't any think so. See, this is where I'm oh, the okay. optimist. Okay. I, I you think, think they would have been happier he would have been happier I think if, if he moved he as, he, come as he out talked of the to closet, come out of the closet, lived with a man yeah. openly. Mm -hmm. I think he was a very loving guy. I he really would have been do. a good day. He would have been a good. I think mate he might have been a good husband. I do. Uh, I don't think so. Well, that's my yeah, optimism, yeah. and I think she also married to a man who was. She might have been. She might have. Been. Who wasn't? You know. I give her better. Better. Uh, I think uh, he liked all this. Anyway, what I saw was two people locked together in a death struggle in which they tortured not only themselves, mm -hmm. but everyone around them. And so what I took away from that is... I knew. People are always saying to me, <laughs> I knew your father, and he was yes, the most charming, exactly. pleasant. I, exactly. I, was in, I, I met him once, and he said to me, he said... Uh, it's a beautiful day, he said. Or, no, or a lot of times they'll have an, a, a nice little quote, like he said, Ossining reminds me of Naples or yes, something like that. And, they then, they, and then they'll, they'll say, I, I, just to have spent your whole life with him, what a blessing, they'll say. <laughs> well, the best thing, and this is, this is proving my mm, point, yeah. is when our mother's there yeah. and they'll say, as Harold Brodsky yeah. said to you, Oh, John, your father, he just loved his children so much. And our mother would say, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't like any of them except Fred. So that even in death, <laughs> the struggle is going on. The, He'd been dead for 20 years when she said that. Well, people came to my house who'd never been to my house, and they met her. And they said, oh, we've just met Ben. We like him. He's so funny and so smart. And she said, smart? She said, <laughs> 
She said, probably drinking a drink I'd given her. Right. And she said, I wouldn't say smart. <laughs> no, well, so I saw that staying in a marriage that didn't mm -hmm. feel good was a terrible mm -hmm. mistake. Mm -hmm. And I think in some ways, we all act out our parents' fantasies. And I think in some ways, so they wanted to get divorced. They wanted mm -hmm. to get divorced. They just didn't have the nerve mm -hmm. to get divorced. Well, he might have been right. They might have thrown him in jail, for all we know. I don't know. Yeah. I just saw milk. Mm -hmm. And it seems to yeah. me that, that if he had, and I think he knew this, mm -hmm. um, that there there might have been a possibility for him to come out in the 70s, not in the 60s, mm -hmm. um, because that's when they did throw yeah. people in jail. Mm -hmm. But by the 70s, it seemed to me that he could have left her, and mm -hmm. uh, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. And and it seemed to me also that she could have left him. No, because the movie, in case anyone's watching who hasn't Milk seen is it, a movie about, about Harvey the murder Milk, of Harvey was, Milk yeah. and George Muscone, but it's the, about... Harvey Milk was the first publicly elected... Gay overtly, activist. Overtly, yeah, overtly, overtly gay guy. Um, but I also think in the 70s, she was very beautiful. Mm. She had many resources. She might have left him. And I think the reason why they didn't leave mm. each other was just fear and, and smallness. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, that was I was what very glad I she saw. came back and took care of him when he, was, when he got sick. Well, once he got uh. sick, she liked him a lot better, yeah, which, of likes, course, well, spoke to read me. Read a little of, bit from the book. Cause we're, yeah, well, this, I'm fascinated, <laughs> but this, but it's, it really is a wonderful book, and it Thank deals you. with an essential question, which is where is um, that gravitational pull you feel toward another person? Where is it a healthy exactly. thing that you should give in to, and where is it a very disturbing? Well, I think mm. it, you're going to give in to it. So it's fine to give into it. Just don't get married. Well, you don't want don't to give into it. Don't merge your books. You, don't have a joint bank account. You don't want to give into it if you're married to somebody else. I don't exactly. Think. Exactly. <laughs> There's a reason that they <laughs> have that. that right. Yeah. But this book will explain to you what it is mm -hmm. so that you'll know to marry the right person mm -hmm. and you'll know not to leave the right person That's if right. you're when already married That's right. When the roller coaster comes along and they say, come on, it's going right. to be a great ride. You say, well, actually, I'm wearing this ring. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's yeah. my hope. It, okay. it actually opens um, with a scene which I think in retrospect was very funny. Mm -hmm. You were there. Yes. You might not think it was so hilarious. Well, it wasn't. Funny. It, w it was fine for me as far as I was concerned. It was fine for me. Yeah. Um, but there were many mm -hmm. people for whom it wasn't fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly if I ever felt in any way hurt by our mother. Mm -hmm. This was a fine way to pay her back. <laughs> <laughs> I think it took her a couple of years for her to forgive me for this wedding, which was at her house. Um, and she had food for your wedding, no food for my, uh, my wedding. She pulled out all the stops. Yeah, yeah. She really did. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's a book which will, I hope, show you in many different mm -hmm. ways the difference between passion mm -hmm. and addiction, mm -hmm. you know, and the difference between what you should give into and enjoy and, and when you should stop mm -hmm. and how you should think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought I'd read the part that has you in it. Oh, of course. Um, <laughs> although, unfortunately, you're not until the fourth paragraph, so you'll just have I'll to have be to, patient. I'll bear with four paragraphs. Standing under a black walnut tree in front of my parents' 18th century house on a spring afternoon, I prepared to get married for the third time in a broad-rimmed rimmed white straw hat and a gauzy blue and white dress. One hand held the crumpled, pre-printed wedding vows. With the other, I tried to comfort my sobbing six-year-old daughter. Weddings make the heart sore. If second marriages are the triumph of hope over experience, as Samuel Johnson famously wrote, Third marriages may be the triumph of imagination over experience. <laughs> They're even more improbable and require something closer to delusion than simple hope. There is something delicious and heartening about a wedding. A wedding is a chance to let our dreams seem real, a frothy ceremony that's both a great party and a powerful symbol. And this is even truer when the bride and groom are experienced and knowing. My mother had spent months planning the afternoon of the wedding. And in spite of her own ambivalence about having a daughter who was getting married for the third time, she had pulled out all the stops. There was a creamy canvas tent behind us beneath, between the walnut tree and the house, a small dance floor, platters of poached shrimp, and a gleaming many-tiered white wedding cake 
decorated with garlands of flowers and a miniature bride and groom. 300 friends and relatives had They're come. They're still together, incidentally, the miniature bride. That's, <laughs> no, they were eaten by, well, whatever. <laughs> we don't have to go to the fate of the marzipan <laughs> bride and groom. 300 friends and relatives had come to Westchester from as far away as California to celebrate. The groom's family stood behind us. My handsome brother Ben in his Brooks Brothers ah. suit tried to calm the boisterous children from various families and the undisciplined family dogs. My mother's Labrador retriever growled to warn my corgi away from the house, while the groom's naughty basset hound explored the smells near the buffet table. Didn't you actually write my two handsome younger brothers? I did, but you know, every time I read, I change it a little. <laughs> when you read it to Fred, I guess it'll be <laughs> your handsome brother Fred. <laughs> well, of course not. You're the handsome one. Mm -hmm. no, he's we all handsome. know that. And nine years younger. I think if you yeah. said to my mother, to our mother, mm -hmm. Ben is so handsome, she'd say, why, yes, he is. That's right. Too bad he doesn't have a brain in his head. <laughs> anyway, I'm not go. sure she'd say that. Finish, finish. I'm sorry. No, no, yeah, I finished. Yeah. Oh, you did. I finished. Yeah. I was marrying the love of my life, as That's you right. well know. I remember very proud of myself. You were beginning to fight with him and, and because he drank. Did he ever drink? Did he ever? He used to gave me that famous quote, which turns out is not his originally, but was. I asked him, because he stopped drinking for a little while. He did stop for a little while. And I asked him, what's it like to not drink? And he said, it just means when I wake up in the morning, I know that's as good as I'm going to feel all day. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, well, he didn't. I mean, he and I mm. did our best to develop the kind of mm -hmm. partnership which enables you to mm -hmm. live together. We both really tried very hard after the 18 months mm -hmm. was over which in our case, the 18 months lasted 30 it. years because yeah. obstacles make it yeah. last, yeah. Um, like any addiction. Um, but we just couldn't. But one of the things he did was he stopped drinking mm -hmm. for possibly a year. I don't know when he really started again, mm -hmm. but for quite a while. Mm. Um, we really tried everything over a period of about four years mm -hmm. to make it work, but we couldn't. Mm. It's kind of sad. That's the sad part. Mm -hmm. But you're, you, you, you kind of get along with him, and he's yeah. yeah. I you know I love, you love all my ex-husbands. Yeah. You love. The, I do. I mean, that's the you know the closest thing I know to healthy love. If you don't count my children, mm -hmm. is how I feel about my ex-husbands. <laughs> I think they're wonderful. I'm Maybe very glad to have married we them. We could get a, have a process. Instead of having people go through the 18 months, we could have a process where you, instead of marrying someone, you immediately became their ex. Well, that could work <laughs> for me. Over a period of a couple of weeks. That anyway, could work for me. I, 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 we're, we're, sadly, we're out of time. But thanks so much for coming to Pleasantville and being on PCTV. It's my pleasure. You're a wonderful host. <laughs> and someday we'll get together and read the writings of James Cheever. Who's yes, whoever he might be. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.